Thank you. That would be on. And Randy's going to play the intro music. Right. He'll right. play the intro okay. music for us. We are now live on Facebook. What's poppin', no stopping, just make sure you watching. This is a show for entrepreneurs and for those who clockin'. Black people, brown people, ass people, ass people. This culture, we're supposed to support one another, let love take over. In the living room, welcome to it's the living room. Welcome, welcome to the living room. Welcome, welcome to the living room. A real conversation. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in to The Living Room. Of course, it's your boy, and I'm back. I'm back from a Ruba call. <laughs> I didn't want to come back, but I'm back. I, I thought I may have had the show of The Living Room in Aruba, but uh, they kicked me out, right? But we're back here. We're here in the wonderful state of Maryland, and it's so good that you've tuned in. And uh, I'm here with Carl. Uh, Snowden, who is the convener of the Caucus of African American Leaders. And of course, we're doing our monthly uh, meeting tonight uh, with the caucus. And so uh, while you're on Facebook and you're watching, uh, we're going to make sure that uh, if there's something that you like, that you'll go ahead and hit that like button. And if it's something that Carl is going to say that you love, uh, we want you to hit that heart button. Just keep on hitting it, too. You know, give us a lot of hearts. Most of all, we want you to chat and communicate with us. Uh, you may have questions. You may have comments that you want to share with us, some vital information that we might not even be uh, privy to. We want you to put that right in the chat room, uh, in, in the chat. Um, so now today, as we're opening up for our wonderful discussion and giving out some great information, but like always, we got to bring the man uh, from above. <laughs> we have to bring the Lord into the house, and we have none other than the Esquire, the guru himself, the Reverend, Ricky Nelson Jones, he's going to give us the invocation. Let us pray, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> the heavens are thine. The earth also is thine. The world and the fullness thereof, thou hast founded it. And let us Psalm 89 and 11, Lord, we bow to you knowing you're the only creator. You're the only God. You're the only one in charge, and you're the only one who get the final say-so. We bow to you as the only God. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died for us on Calvary's cross. Lord, we thank you for bringing us together once again in safety. Keep us safe, Lord, as we discuss important matters of the day, matters of fairness, matters of justice, matters of equity. Shake us up and wake us up, Lord, to know that love is the answer to mankind and womankind's problems. It is not racial division. It is not the Caucasian delusion of superiority. It is humbly loving our fellow man. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Have your way, Lord. Thank God. Amen. 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 Thank you, uh, Reverend, uh, for that awesome invocation. It is my distinct pleasure, and I always have uh, uh, when I have the opportunity to introduce who I call my mentor, and I always tell everybody I just haven't paid them yet. <laughs> uh, but uh, everything that I've learned about activism and, and advocacy, and then just loving on the people that's in our community to try to make a better day and to make a better uh, solution, bring better solutions in the community. It's because of the man that's sitting right here beside me. He is the convener of the Caucus of African American Leaders. Let's give it up for my good friend, Carl O. Snowden. And the O <laughs> is for outstanding. <laughs> uh, I've been telling people all day long, uh, Bishop and I have been together, and I've been telling people, this man's wearing this fantastic top. <laughs> I keep telling people, I love this top. And those who are watching, I told them this morning at another meeting that he should go into GQ. This man knows how to dress. Uh, several people that was with me were saying that it's his wife that dresses him. <laughs> but it was uh, Jimmy Spearman who said, no, 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 no. It's got to be this man doing it himself. I want to take this moment to introduce one of our outstanding leaders uh, in the NAACP. She is going to be giving the welcome on behalf of Jacqueline Ossoff, who is the president of the NAACP, 
but we have the NAACP second vice president, and that is the Honorable Claudia Barber. Judge Barber. Good evening, everyone. I greet you from the Interlude County chapter and branch of the NAACP. We are uh, oftentimes an organization that Thank you, Judge Barbara, the first vice president of the NAACP of Anne Arundel County. I misspoke in the introduction. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your dedication. You had mentioned injustices. And 40 years ago, as we set the tone for our next presenter, uh, Wanda uh, Brown, there are a lot of things that can happen in America, but probably one of the saddest things that can happen to anyone is you lose a loved one. Forty years ago this month, driving down Ritchie Highway in a place called Glen Burnie, Maryland, a young African-American male stopped his V, was stopped by an Anne Arundel County police officer. What should have been a simple traffic stop escalated to an incident where that man, Leroy Perry, was shot two times fatally and died. His family never forgot his death. And this coming Tuesday, July 20th, at the People's Park, the family and the community will celebrate the life of Leroy Perry. No further ado, Wanda Brown, are you with us, the daughter of Leroy Perry? Ms. Brown. Emma, is uh, Ms. Brown on or is she um, muted? I I see a Wanda, but um, that's she her. might be muted. That's her. Let's see if that's her. <clears throat> Bishop, the great technology, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's on. She's still muted. She's trying. Okay. Wanda, thank you. Hi, can you hear me? We hear you very well. <laughs> welcome. Okay. Welcome, welcome to the living room. I was having audio problems. <laughs> Give us quickly... Uh, who, what, when, and where, and tell us why you have decided 40 years after the death of your father to hold this tribute to him. Well, first of all, I am my dad's first daughter. And my dad was a mom dad. My father did everything for the, for, uh, for the three girls, just like a mom would do. His, he's from the South, from North Carolina, and my grandmother taught the boys to look after their sisters. My dad did our hair, 
He cooked our meals. He took us shopping. He took us to our appointments. Anything that a woman would do, my father did for his girls. He used to take us on um, field trips on the weekend. My mother worked for the CNP telephone company back then on a swing shift. So he did everything. He was very, uh, very uh, close to his um, children and family. So tell us about the incident that's coming Tuesday, where it's going to be and whether it's open to the public and that sort of thing. Yes. The um, ceremony of celebration of life will be held on July the 20th, 2021 at 6 p.m., the same day of his death. And it will be held at People's Park, located at 44 Calvert Street in Annapolis, Maryland. And I hope all will come out because it's very, very important because anyone could have been Leroy Perry. And I'm not doing it just for my father, but for, but for his descendants, the grandkids, the great grandkids. And he has a great, great granddaughter that he's never seen. And to know what his legacy was, besides just being shot to his death, but to know the person, the man and the person and the father that he was. Well, let me, th let me thank you for taking the leadership. Before we have you depart, I just want to share with the audience. Your father was killed 40 years ago. And how ironic it is that 40 years ago, there was nothing called Black Lives Matter. There were no demonstrations being led by various organizations. But I remember that incident. I remember it very well. Your father had a screwdriver. He had a broken uh, trunk. Correct. And he was using the screwdriver to open the trunk. And he was shot fatally. And I will never forget the demonstrations that occurred. Even in that day, people were outraged over the fact that he had was shot and killed. But here is some good news that I want to share with the public. His death was not in vain because as a result of Leroy Perry being shot, even then there was this call for more police reform and arguing that had there been body cameras, because in that day there was no body camera, it was his word against the police. Forty years later, and this is what we're going to celebrate here in Anne Arundel County, as a result of his death, we will now have body cameras, and every police officer will be required to carry one. And the good news is that the Anne Arundel County Human Relations Commission has agreed unanimously to put up a plaque in People's Park so that he will always be remembered. So I want to encourage people to come to the event this coming Tuesday, July 20th, at 6 p.m. It's going to go from 6 to 7 p.m. Now, Wanda, can you quickly tell us, for those who are watching and want to get more information, how do they get a hold of you? What's a telephone number? Sure. My email address is brownwanda8931 at gmail.com, and I can be reached by telephone 410-693-2888. 72. Thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you. I'll be there next week, and I'm going to encourage others to be there as well. We'll be there to celebrate the life of Leroy Perry. Thank you again. And I cannot thank everyone for some tremendous support then and now for my father's legacy and to, and to make this happen. Thanks so much, and I appreciate it, and I hope to see you all there. You will. So much, especially while my mother's living. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Bishop, All right. Bishop, one of the incredible things is Anne Arundel County has changed so much. Um, we talked about her uh, father and his passing. There was not a uh, organizations like the other day that addressed these kind of issues. And the county government in its wisdom has hired a new person whose responsibility it is to look at policies through the eyes of equity and to determine whether those policies will, will be policies that will be fair to everyone. And so I'm going to step out along with the Reverend Jones and set in the audience while you interview the next guest who you'll be introducing.
right, that sounds good. And our guests will take my place. <laughs> <laughs> and while uh, you guys are uh, doing the switcheroo there, I just want to remind everyone, if you're just joining us here on The Living Room where real conversations take place, we are having the caucus of African American leaders a meeting, monthly meeting here uh, on The Living Room. So thank you for tuning in. And Carl, here's a good thing that uh, it's not just here on, in Anne Arundel County, but people are watching from different parts of, uh, of our nation, uh, Memphis, Tennessee, and uh, Detroit, Michigan, and down in Hampton, Virginia, where I'm from. That's right, Virginia's for lovers. And, uh, and uh, so just different parts uh, uh, of here in our nation. They're actually watching the caucus of African-American leaders and seeing some of the good things that are actually happening here in our region. And again, as Carl had mentioned, he mentioned that we, uh, the, this gentleman that I'm going to be introducing that's sitting beside me now, uh, that the county, our county, Anne Arundel County, county has decided that they want to continue to make changes uh, for the good, for the better. And so they went out and did, uh, I heard it was an intense search, and they found a man. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I'd like to introduce to you today our new uh, Anne Arundel County Director of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. All right, so welcome, Mr. Richard H., a.k.a. Pete Hill. Indeed, indeed. So, Bishop, I just want to get started by saying, first of all, thank you for inviting me here tonight. As the new Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Director, I want people to understand that equity, as the Reverend said, is about policies, procedures, and common practices. And I look at those things to see what is that language saying and how would that impact people. Diversity is about empathy. When we are police, health departments, et cetera, and we look at diverse constituents, are we treating them with empathy? And last but not least, inclusion is about how do we use the talent that's available? Are we truly including everybody in Anne Arundel County government? Right. So when I got hired, I understood that to be my pri primary responsibility. But I want everyone within the sound of my voice to know that those are my official duties. I'm here to support the community in any way I can, and I've already started doing that with Carl. In fact, Carl was the very first person that contacted me the day I came to work. So I'm happy to be here, and whatever I can do to move equity forward, right. do not hesitate to call me. Right. Well, first, and then we appreciate uh would you just share with us? And so I want to just back up just, just for a moment. And uh, we want to know the man, the myth, the legend. <laughs> Name Richard Hill, right? And so I know you had told me that you were from the South. I want to say, what was Indeed. it? Mississippi, is it? No, sir. No? The great state of Mississippi. The great Indeed. state of Mississippi, by the way, right? Indeed. And so, so you come to, come to Maryland to bring some of that Southern hospitality. That's exactly right. You know, people always look at Mississippi as backwards, shall we say, let's just be honest. But I will remind all Americans that it was Mississippians, Fannie Lou Hamer, Mega Evers, that pushed the Civil Rights Movement forward. And it was the death of a Mississippian, 1955, that brought awareness to the entire nation. When a young 14-year-old was murdered in Money, Mississippi, it became front page news right. for whistling at a white woman. And so... Allegedly. Yeah, allegedly. And so I held from that state, and it shaped my perception of the world. Right. And when I left that state to join the military, where I spent 22 years, okay. it further shaped my world view. Right. And because of those two uh, experiences, growing up in Mississippi and traveling the world in the military, it gave me this insatiable need to help people who need help. So that's a little bit about the guy they call Pete. All right. So, and... Uh so how did you get up to, into this region, to Anne Arundel County? How did you end up here in, in Maryland? Funny story. <laughs> Way back in 1988, I did a favor for an Army buddy of mine. I allowed him to stay with me for free for one year. Uh-oh. <laughs> and I forgot about that. So I retired from the military in 2006, and out of the blue, he called me and said, hey, man, what are you doing when you retire? So I told him I was about to become a high school teacher in Georgia. He said, man, you want to come up to D.C. and get a good government job. 
And so I reminded him that I only had half a paycheck because I just retired. And he then reminded me, you don't remember that time I stayed with you for free for one year? I want to return the favor. And that's how I ended up in Maryland. Oh, wow. Doing wow. a kind favor in 1988, came back to pay back me and tremendously in all those years later. So that's how I got here. Wow. 1988, you say, or 98? 1988. 88. Wow. Yes. Um, I, was, I was just joining the Army in 86. So how about that? <laughs> so, uh, but we're glad to have you here. And like I said before, uh, I know uh, speaking with um, Dr. K and others who were helping with the process of hiring um, our new uh, for the office that, uh, that they created. Mm -hmm. uh, to make such an impact of, of change here. And, uh, and they said uh, that they had a, a wide selection. And you were, uh, out of you know, many people, you were th that chosen one. And so we, you know, we're eager to work alongside with you. And I think one of the goals were uh, to immediately meet with community leaders and, like you said, uh, the Honorable Carl Snowden was the first Indeed. that you met, and I know that that we've met, and others you, you've been meeting. That's in uh, that's in the community that's also uh, making an impact. So tell me from uh, from your perspective, how do you view our county, um, and what are your um, <clears throat> goals for? plans for this year, what do you see how you, you, how you really want to start working um, alongside with community leaders as well as uh, within the, the, the agency itself? So you asked me, how did I see this county? Yeah. When I first moved up here in 2006, and I gleefully told all of my black friends that I was moving to Glen Burnie. <laughs> the first question they asked me was, am I crazy? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? I said, man, it's nothing but a bunch of rednecks in Glen Burnie. I said, great, I'm from Mississippi, I'll fit right in. <laughs> That's a true story, by the way. <laughs> but my vision is that of Mr. Stuart Pittman. What he asked me to do when I got here was to come up with a countywide equity plan that would reach both internal and external stakeholders, which requires me to meet people like yourself, Bishop, and others in the community, as well as employees who work for the government. Again, Carl and I are currently working on some things together just to demonstrate my point. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not just here to work internally. I am here to work with people like this organization and others, be it in the LGBTQ plus community, so forth and so on. Wherever you need me in terms of equity, diversity, and inclusion, I'm simply a phone call or an email away. And if I can't do what you think I can do, I will try my best to point you in the right direction because clearly I don't have all of the answers. Right. Close, but not all. <laughs> okay, I like that, that confidence that he has there for us. <laughs> Listen, I know that uh, we can talk all night. We have a lot of things we're, we're, we're just meeting, and so I know there's a lot of things that we'll be able to um, share and talk about and to just strengthen relationship and building capacity. Um, but uh, we only have but a certain a certain amount of time here uh, <laughs> right. on the living room and the caucus meeting. So, but I want to say thank you once again for uh, being who you are, indeed, and also accepting the position of uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion as the director, and uh, and looking forward to making an impact together and seeing some substantial changes indeed taking place here in our county. And again, welcome and thank you for assume in that position. I just want to leave you with one thought, though, Bishop. Uh-oh. <laughs> People never resist change. They resist being changed. So make sure we never forget that. Okay, all right. We, we got a pen in the memory, in the memory bank. <laughs> all right, let's give it up one more time for the new director of equity, diversity, and inclusion, the Mr. from Mississippi, Richard H., a.k.a. Pete Hill. And we have... The Honorable <laughs> Carl O, and the O stands for O, oh, don't mess with him, <laughs> Snowden. He is back on the couch here in the living room where real conversations take place and the caucus of African-American leaders monthly meeting. I love it when we can get together and meet on a monthly basis, even though we probably yeah. meet almost every day. Every day. <laughs>
Uh, so where we're at next. Bishop, you know, one of the things uh, both Pete, yourself, and others who are watching are not natives of Anne Arundel County. Uh, you made the point about Virginia being for lovers. Well, we'll leave that alone. <laughs> we heard this thing about Mississippi being such a great state. Uh, the reality is Anne Arundel County is an interesting community. And for those of us who are natives of this county, we've seen changes coming. And unfortunately for far too many people, these changes, they've not been part of. So if you've lived in Anne Arundel County, I grew up in a place called Davisonville and then Annapolis, you've seen the city, the county change. Well, those changes don't happen by accident. Right. A government gets in place, put together a policy that begins to shape what a county will look like. And we're going to have the rare opportunity to have coming to the podium or coming to the stage, James Kitchen. James Kitchen is the director of community uh, engagement and constituent services. Please join us. And what part of the reason we're having him come today is to have him share with us, the county executive has a plan called 2040. And for people watching tonight's program, 20 years from now, what will Anne Arundel County look like? What will be the demographics? What kind of housing will exist in this county? That's all being decided now. When I was growing up in this county, as I mentioned, there were all kinds of changes that occurred. And for the vast majority of African Americans, there were not participants in it. You lived in a county where your life was determined by others. So, James, you come and said the county executive want to change that. Tell us about 2040 no, and what I, that means. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, both of you, for, for having us here and for giving us um, an opportunity to come to share and for all the work you do in, your, in the community. I'll, I'll start by saying I was actually had the pleasure of being on the initial s search committee for um, Mr. Hill that you all just interviewed, and uh, he is absolutely the right guy. And, and that is, I've, I've seen the office hire a handful of people by far the most extensive search process and vetting process I've seen us do. We, we had one meeting where you came and gave a presentation and there, there were probably 30 community members there listening to it as well. And then after, it, it was you and one finalist that did that. And then the county executive said, tell me what you think and, and listen to community members um, and, and heard um, th their thoughts in the process. And so it was really, like we really do want that position as Pete explained to be both internal and external, which is why we had so many external partners be part of that hiring process and, and he did he did great so he absolutely is the right guy and I will tell you and when did he start the 21st J June 21st was his first day so in the past few weeks and I was on vacation one of those weeks past two weeks I've seen just having him in the room and bringing that perspective to everything like that matters um, and, and it has been such a blessing and I've, I've really enjoyed working with you so far and I'm so excited for um, what that position what Pete as an individual will bring to it um, in working with communities moving forward. And, and this is one of those issues um, and, and topics where, where my office and, and the whole executive office will coordinate with, with Pete and everyone to try to really move this forward. So plan 2040, it's actually a state requirement that every county passes a general development plan that lays out what the growth patterns will look like in the county for, for the next 20 years or so. And, and we just finished going through that process and the county council just just passed that that um, bill and, and that plan really does has far reaching impacts and as, as you said we have to have people at the table who, who are part of planning what that change will look like so a, a couple examples um, here on, on just how equity is involved in land use planning all parts of public policy um, in, in government policies help, have helped create the society we have, right? And have helped create the, the systemic injustices that, that are present and the inequities that are present. And it's gonna take concerted government effort to undo some of those things that government created, right? And so we want this to be part of that process. So in, in a handful of areas, so even looking at the environment in Anne Arundel County, one of the things that Plan 2040 showed us was the areas of the county with the least amount of tree cover, of tree canopy, mm -hmm. um, are, are very strongly correlated with the places that, that are more heavily African-American um, and, and Latino Hispanic and also lower income. And, and, and so a lot of the environmental investments have gone into other communities and, and not into those communities. That creates like heat zones in the summer. Um, we're going through one of those right now, right? And if you don't have right. as many trees and tree canopy in your neighborhoods, it is literally hotter in, in, in the hot summer days when you're walking outside. And so it goes to, to quality of life. Um, some of the most degraded streams in Anne Arundel County are in neighborhoods that are, are predominantly 
African American and Latino and Hispanic, and they've not had the same kind of investment as other areas of the county. Um, Rex and Parks did, did two studies leading up to, to passing the overall plan 2040. They did a proximity analysis, like how close do people and residents live to parks, um, and also an equity analysis of where those park resources are being put. And in both of those studies showed that we need more investments in our Rex and Parks facilities in, in the north and the western parts of our county um, that, that are more predominantly um, African American and, and Hispanic. Like we need to be putting these public infrastructures closer to these communities. Um, and, and if you look at housing, I don't need to tell, tell this group the history of housing in this country, but, but from redlining to blockbusting to restrictive covenants all, all the way, concerted public policy created the residential segregation that we experience, and, and that has an impact in schools, on libraries, so many different pieces of infrastructure. And, and we really want to have the, the plan for the next 20 years to take, like, very intentionally look at, like, how do we un, undo that, right? So one of the county executive's big promises in Plan 2040 was we're gonna take some of that power away from, from backroom deals and, and, and from, from people who, um, have traditionally had more of a say, and, and we're gonna give that power back to communities, and, and they did that. And we're very, very thankful for the county council's vote to do that. It, it was, a, it was a, a very brave thing to do, but they literally said, okay, instead of doing comprehensive rezoning and some of these big decisions now, we're gonna create nine regional areas in the county, and, and we want local stakeholder groups of community members that represent those communities to really help hone down and, and determine these policies and land use um, patterns in their parts of the county. And, and that process is starting now. And again, for people in government who had power and, and could have exercised it and chose to give it back to communities, that, that was a huge um, priority for the county executive. So, so let me ask you this, James. For people watching tonight who hear all of this, right. what they would want to know is how would they become part of it? What's the process for somebody who's in Dale, somebody who's in Brooklyn, right. somebody who's in Pumphrey, who might want to be part of helping to shape the future? How do they get involved? So, so Plan 2040 divided the counties in nine regional areas, and we're going to do those regional area plans with those stakeholder groups in, in sets of three. And so we are taking applications right now for three areas of the county. So it's regional areas two, four, and, and seven. Two is, is Jessup, Annapolis Junction, Laurel, Maryland City, Fort Meade, um, Hanover, Russet, parts of Hanover, all, all of Russet, but that western part of the county. So that, that's one region where we are soliciting applications now for people to be on the So when you, when you say soli uh, solicit an application, for people watching, what does that mean in terms of soliciting application? I, I'm asking this facetiously, but it's a reason for this. Right. Do you have to have a PhD? Do you have to, have to be an engineer? Do you have to have planning in your background? Who qualifies to be sitting on this uh, committee or commission that will help decide the future of the county? Right, so, so no to any of those official qualifications, right? Mm -hmm. we, we want people that, that have, have time and just share a vision of, of planning with, with an eye to equity and, and into making, again, the, the next 20 years of, of planning and land use not look like the past 20 years. Um, you need, it's gonna be about, it's an 18 month commitment to help put one of these plans together for that area of the county. So gotta have commitment for, for 18 months and it is about eight hours a month, about four hours of meetings is, is what we're estimating, and then four hours of, of community outreach, just talking to community members in, in your area, um, holding listening sessions where you listen and say, like, how, how do you want this part of the county to look like, and how can we do that there? So, so it's mainly time. We, we do have goals on, you know, we, we want one resident that's a long-term resident, more than 20 years, a, a shorter-term resident, less than 20 years, someone representing a student group, someone representing a small business, a, a religious organization. We want these stakeholder groups to, to be representative of the communities in every sense of the way um, and to look very different than, than what past advisory groups have looked like. So any person that has a heart for your community and a heart for creating positive change and helping to undo some of these things. So through how, did they, how did they do that? Did they go online? Did they call right. you? Is there a telephone number? And again, if there is a telephone number, share it with us if there is a online they need to go and apply tell us how to do that okay so so again the, the three areas of the county so it's it's west county we went over that and then it's um area four is pasadena savannah park arnold cape st Clair, the broadneck peninsula that, that area is one group that we're looking for a committee for now um and then seven is is annapolis like greater annapolis annapolis neck reva parole bay ridge highland beach that part of the county so those are the three areas that are starting now 
Um, you can own a business there. You don't have to live there. Two thirds of the members do have to be from that that region, um, but, but not everybody. Mm -hmm. But if if you go online, there, there will be a um, aacounty.org, and then if you search for Plan 2040, you could search for Plan 2040 in Arundel County on Google, and, and it will pop up. Give us a telephone number for people who are old school, who may not be <laughs> as savvy as uh, some, but who would like to make a telephone call and get more information. Who do they call? So, so you can call um, our office, Community Engagement and Constituent Services. So that's 410-222-1785. And, and we can definitely answer questions and, and direct you to the right spot. There's an online Google form that is the application. Um, but, but we'll come to you, too. You can email me directly, james.kitchen at aacounty.org. And, and even if, if you're not interested, but you know somebody like in your church or in your business, like in your, your son's soccer coach, somebody who, who you think would be a good advocate for your community and for your part of the county, e email me. We can have someone on my team, someone from planning and zoning, like give a personal call and say, hey, this person recommended you and think you would be really good at that. Mm -hmm. um, but, but we have a commitment to, to make sure that these groups truly do represent the communities that, that they're planning for so that we'll have more equitable outcomes in that process. And well, James, oh, just one question. Um, is there a, a certain amount of uh, people that you're looking for per area? Per, per area, so it will range from, from nine to 15. So we want at least nine for every area, up to 15. And then again, it's really gonna depend. We don't all, we don't want all one, one person, right? We don't want seven business leaders. <laughs> we don't want se seven of anything, right? Like we right. want a business leader, a Diversity. long term resident, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a community advocate, an environmental advocate. So nine to 15 is, is gonna be the committee size. Um, and, and again, diversity in every sense of the word, just truly representative of the communities that they're helping to plan for. Good. Well, on that note, James, I want to thank you, or we would like to thank you for being part of this. And I want to really encourage the community again. Here's an opportunity to make a difference. Right. So often what happens is other people decide what your fate is. The county government is giving you an opportunity to participate in the process. 2040. We don't have enough time to go into this because we've got to go with the other parts of the program. But I want you to think of this for a moment. Anne Arundel County is changing, and it's changing rapidly. The racial makeup of this county is changing. The community is changing. And here you have an opportunity to be part of the change. So again, sir, thank you for yeah, joining us. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Pete, Pete Hill and I will come to any church, any place, talk about it. You want more information, let us know. Thank All you, right. sir. Well, you know where we're at now, James. Right. <laughs> uh, Bishop, you know, we're going to be talking about, uh, with you, this upcoming Peace Walk, which is the next su subject that we have. Um, and I have a couple people in the audience that I'm just going to ask to come up who happen to be former police officers. Lottie, would you come join us for a moment? And Randy, would you come up? Please. Come up and... That's okay. Come on and be in the living room, right. our living room. Uh, and the reason I want them to come up, um, and neither one of them were expected oh. to be there. Oh, you um, good? You good? They're both police officers, former police officers, who bring. You want to sit there and let Randy here. Um, they bring a wealth of experience, and the reason I want them to join us in this discussion, which is going to be a brief discussion, is the following reason. The United Black Clergy of Anne Arundel County has been doing something over the years that I believe have made a huge difference. Long before there was this controversy, it was the United Black Clergy under the leadership of Apostle Larry Lee Thomas, who used to say so eloquently, solid no more. And I happen to have been one of the persons who was part of last year's peace march. And last year, to put this in context, was when we had the death of George Floyd. So there was huge concerns about police and community relations. And so Bishop uh, Palmer, along with the United Black Clergy, have come up with a plan. They call it the Peace Walk. And Bishop, you normally don't be the person being interviewed. You do an interview, <laughs> but we're going to switch the tables here a little bit, have you tell us a little bit about this, and then see what these police officers, former police officers, think of your plan to better increase police community relations. Well, I appreciate that, Carl, and thanks for having me on your show tonight. <laughs> but um, definitely, so it, the history of our uh, Prayer and Peace Walk, I think it's been about five years now, and uh, Apostle Thomas, along with uh, Bishop Eric Wright, they galvanized and started, began to have it right here in West County, uh, in Mead Village, um, Steel Meadows, Spring Meadows, Pioneer City, 
Uh, and to, it, it start off, it, you know, we're going to pray. We're going to walk. We're going to pray and, uh, and, and pray for the community. And then it, and then it started, uh, then we started having talks with the police department. And then they started coming out to the annual uh, uh, prayer and peace walk. Uh, and then so that relationship was how can we uh, build trust, rebuild trust, if there was ever <laughs> any trust, but how can we uh, build better relationship with the community and the police? Um, and so we thought that having this walk, having the, uh, the, not only the prayer, but we have our megaphones and bullhorns and so forth where we're giving out good um, inspirational um, information and advice and encouragement to the community. So you have people that, uh, different people, whether delegates were there, uh, uh, elected officials, as well as, uh, you know, the um, chief of police, uh, then it was, last year was Altamara, and, and, and I believe that uh, Chief Howard would be with us on Saturday, this Saturday. Um, and, so what and, time is it going to be? So, at, right, people so, watching you? Right, so, so this Saturday, July 17th, yeah. At 9.30 a.m., we're meeting uh, at Van Bocklin uh, Elementary School at 9.30. That's where we're going to gather, give some instructions. We're actually going to be shuttled to the first site, which is Spring Meadows, by the swimming pool. And uh, we're going to have, that's where our, our first prayer is going to be given up and, and speech there. And then we walk from there. That's going to start promptly at 10 o'clock. <laughs> And then we're going to go to Steel Meadows. A lot of people don't know it's, it's a spring meadow and a Steel <laughs> Meadows that's across the street from each other. And, uh, and then by that swimming pool there, then we stop and we pray for Steel Meadows community. And, uh, and then we have people like yourself, Carl, that's going to give us a dynamic um, uh, word of encouragement. And then we, then we, again, we begin to walk again. And we walk right into Pioneer City or Pioneer Drive. And uh, by that swimming pool, or used to be swimming pool, which that's a whole lot of unhold another story. And thank God for Councilwoman Sarah Lacey, who's here tonight with us in person. Um, but uh, we're, we, we pray there for Pioneer City. And, uh, and then we have someone else that's going to be giving a speech. And let me give this plug in. I got news today that gubernatorial candidate Wes Moore is going to be joining us. Uh, as well as other elected officials and so forth. Uh, then we march on uh, all the way to Me Village, mm -hmm. okay, and uh, and we we end up in Me Village uh, by the old basketball courts, and uh, and and we have our final prayer and speeches that are done there. Now this year, we're actually having right after the march. We have the food truck coming out called. The food is all free and hamburgers, hot dogs, turkey burgers for everybody that want to be healthy. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, and loads of fun for the kids. We got moon bounce, face painting, and other things that are going to be taking place. Um, so it's, it's, it's not only the peace and prayer walk, but it's also like a community day that's going to be for the community. And it's open to the public. It's open to the public. If you're, uh, not, uh, especially the residents in, in, the, uh, in the area there, um, in Me Village and Pioneer City and Steel Meadows, we want the residents, uh, just like last year, we want them to come out, be a part of uh, the change that's taking place. Um, so that's kind of, the, in a nutshell, what's, what's happening. Let me switch to these two gentlemen. Preachers and police, do they go together? <laughs> Which one do you want to start? Don't be shy. Yeah, absolutely. It goes together. Um, community leaders. Randy, why don't you do this real quick for people? Okay. I know you're well-known and all that, but there's somebody <laughs> that may not know. This is Sergeant, former retired Sergeant, Randy Williams. Randy Williams, retired Baltimore Baltimore County, County Police. Police. Okay. Um, absolutely, they go together. Um, I used to work in youth and community resources in Baltimore County Police Department under the late Kim Ward. She died last year of ovarian cancer. Um, and that unit, we were responsible for building bridges with the communities. And our method of doing that was is to reach out to the community leaders, designate and find out who they were. Our leaders would talk to their leaders, and then their leaders, uh, the community leaders, would preach our message to their constituents. Um, so that's one of the ways we build bridges. And we listen to their requests. We're really a list of demands. Um, 
because certain communities, as we know, are policed while others are served. We don't have to figure out which one is which. It's right. the black and brown communities that are policed and sometimes over-policed. Um, so we listen to their concerns, again, a list of demands, and we try to meet those demands, right? What do we need to do to serve you like we're serving everyone else in the population? So yes, preaching and police go hand in hand. Lonnie, I want to get your take on this. Uh, uh, Randy comes from Baltimore County Police Department. It's predominantly white. You are from the metropolitan Washington, D.C. You worked in Washington, D.C., which, of course, has a larger African-American population. When you hear what Bishop describes in terms of the peace war, how does that resonate with you? And tell people a little bit about your background. Well, I was, uh, I worked for MPD, which is the Metropolitan Police Department, for 26 years, one year with the Housing Authority Police. And I think that, well, Randy would have been the person that I would have went to as a sergeant to bring this uh, community together, you know, the leaders. And as Bishop says, absolutely is important because you always have to have a spiritual background when you're talking about community, especially black communities. And um, I was, I went about it a little different because I was actually an officer in this community. So I worked my last years, I worked the footbeat in a low income area called Woodland Terrace. Um, you know, it was a lot of violence and a lot of uh, things going on, but the community has, and not just the community, but the parents, the, the kids, and, you know, they have to learn to trust you. And if they don't trust you, then you can't get any information. You can't get information. You don't know how to combat the situation or the problem. So I think that the number one goal is to get the community or the number one goal is to get the police to be trusted. And I think there's a huge lack of trust in, in, in that community of police. Bishop, I wanted to turn back to you because this gives us an excellent opportunity to be able to uh, bring another police officer in this discussion, um, a former police officer, James Spearman. But before bringing them on, we're in Odington, or we're in the western part of the county. And we talk about police and community relations. And two years ago, in this community, in a place called Odington, an African-American young person was stopped for presumably a traffic violation. That somehow escalated into this particular young man uh, being stopped by a police officer and a bystander. Because remember, before 2021, the Anne Arundel County Police Department had no body cameras. So a, body, so a bystander captures a photo of a black man having a white police officer with his foot on the neck of this person. Charges are subsequently dropped by the Anne Arundel County Police, Anne Arundel County State's Attorney's Office, but there's a lot of anger in the community because their people felt that this guy was unjustly treated. And some thought, well, he didn't get charged with anything and he was able to avoid incarceration, so he should be happy. But he's not. And so you and I and others are going to be attending tomorrow a trial board that's going to take place at the Western District starting at 9 a.m. And Sergeant Spearman, who's going to join this conversation, James Spearman, former Annapolis Police Department, is going to describe to us what a trial board is, and then we're going to have a roundtable discussion on this issue. So, uh, Sergeant Spearman, could you tell us briefly what is a trial board and what is the purpose of a trial board? Good evening, all. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is James Spearman. I'm a retired sergeant of the Annapolis City Police Department. I have 33 years of service. Um, so, basically, what, uh, what a trial board is, is, is um, usually an administrative proceeding. Um, where there's a dispute between the officer and the management of the whatever agency that the officer works for. So um, generally what happens is the officer is being accused of a violation of departmental policy and the officer either disagrees with um, whether or not they violated the policy or they disagree with the punishment that is being uh, presented. 
So in short, it's like a, a court proceeding. The officer gets to put on testimony. The, um, in this case, the county police will be putting on their testimony. There will be a three man uh, or three person uh, board uh, that will be hearing the evidence. They will be list listening to all the facts. They will be taking evidence. And then from that, they will make a judgment on whether or not the officer is guilty of what the police department is accusing, accusing him of. One quick question, too, before we open it up to a sort of general discussion. The process you just described has changed because of the Maryland House of Delegates and the Maryland Senate voted, unan not unanimously, but voted overwhelmingly to remove this process because the process you're describing which is the one of the last processes like this that will be taking place involve only police officers the three members of the trial board are all police officers under the new system civilians will be involved what was the rationale if you know why was it only police officers who were under this system allowed to review the conduct of fellow police officers because in the law enforcement community there, or it is a belief within that community that only a police officer can adequately judge the actions of another officer because of the unique, uniqueness of the career and the uh, responsibility that comes with um, holding that position. Thank you. Bishop, um, you've been dealing with police community relations and generally what I find is when you talk to police officers, um, there's been this division created, us versus them. I saw a sign that said, defend the police. And then I saw another group say, defund the police. A bumper sticker kind of uh, analysis. Isn't it more complicated than that? It's almost <laughs> strikingly a good comparison of about what's the parallel to what's actually uh, the mindset of the community and the police. Um, um, it is a little more complicated than that, um, but because of the distrust from uh, police officers who have not been reprimanded for actions that were unbecoming as a public uh, servant, uh, especially in, in the uh, black and brown communities. And because uh, when some uh, actions are committed wrong and, and unjust against our communities and then nothing um, is corrected about it that's what brings that distrust there used to be officer friendlies and things like that where people where the community where the officer was there we don't even have that anymore um, so uh, it you know it's a hard road to build trust uh, but it takes those deep dive conversations and hopefully uh, from the chief down that we can start seeing the community's aspect and then turn around because there are in those deep dive conversations we also have to hear um the, the police side because there are some the reason why i said it is because my brother is a retired police officer and he tells me things too from from his perspective that we may not see sometimes you know and we know that there are certain fears and things like that i don't care if you carry a gun or right. not right. you have humanity and um, so that there are certain you know, fears too, but how can we have these conversations? One of the things is you can have a conversation with me all day as a leader and I may not even stay in the community any longer, but we have to have more police officers having deep dive conversations with the community itself so that they can hear the community a perspective, the community can hear their perspective, but at the end of the day, there has to be accountability. There has to be more transparency. If not, we can talk trust all day. Right. So, and that's, so, so that is almost a striking parallel when you see that. Now, as far as defund, when they say defund the police, I think it's really uh, the wording itself or the term itself um, does not really give value to what the people really want, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so it's not like we're saying just take all the money from the police, <laughs> you know, and not let them have anything, or whatever. But there are a lot. I mean, they've been, you know, militarized, and uh, a lot of the a lot of funds have gone to you know these 
high tech weapons and all kinds of stuff and whatever, you know, and you know, we got broomsticks right. we're fighting with kind of thing, you know, in the community. So um uh but but resources can be allocated to help what some of the things that are actually happening in the community uh, versus buying more weaponry and things of that nature. So that's kind of the right. concept for defunding. It's not like let's just strip them from everything. You know, um, Clint Eastwood became famous <laughs> in Dirty Harry when he said, make my day, and he had this huge gun. And it's something I want to ask all of these police, former police officers, a question that has always kind of uh, puzzled me. Let me see if you guys can answer this question. We've been told when there's fatal shootings by police officers that police officers have to make a split second decision. And so those of us who are on the outside should not be able to make a determination as to whether that particular officer made the right decision. It's a split second decision. And the thing I've never quite understood is all police officers are faced with the exact same situation where they have to make a split second decision. But when you look at the analysis of who gets shot, right. for some strange reason, <laughs> African American and people of color get shot at a larger and greater number, disproportionate, than the white population. So what I want to know is why is it possible that black police officers who carry guns and put in this split level split second decision don't wind up killing white people at the same rate that white police officers kill black people sergeant you got a perspective on that you know I, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, why does that happen culture, culture. Right. um if you want to incorporate um all of the isms that exist in the world yes um these are facts all right um in the 21st century, police today are better trained than ever before in American history. And yet we're still having the same problems as we had in the 20th century and 19th century pertaining to policing. So if it's not the training, then it has to be the culture. All right? And when you have a systemic and structural culture that's based on treating a certain segment of our population as second class citizens, then all the isms that we, we can talk about, right, play a part in those decision makings, right? Um, shoot or don't shoot, right? Uh, again, it goes back to what I said um, earlier. Certain communities are served while others are policed and most often over-policed, mm -hmm. right? And that's a part of the system. Um, you promote from within the system all the way up to the ranks to chief. Um, they were reared in the same system of the Denver line, right? So the system will do everything, will utilize all of its working parts to protect itself. Mm -hmm. They will even cannibalize itself to protect the brand. That's a part of the policing system that has been prevalent in this nation since the inception of policing. All right. Ronnie, would you add something to that? Absolutely. I think also, like Sergeant Williams is saying, but there was a time where I worked uh, major narcotics. And I, each time, I don't know if it was because of my hair, my blackness, but okay, you're going to work 6 and 7D, which is southeast and northeast. And so when I started working DEA task force, we worked the whole city except for Georgetown. We wasn't allowed to go to Georgetown and arrest people. We weren't allowed to go to the clubs and buy narcotics. So... Obviously, there's not going to be a shooting there because we're not allowed there. And you were, if you went and tried to do an operation there, you were absolutely forbidden from going there. Mm -hmm. And that's where the most drugs were. So, I mean, you know, when you, when, like he said, when you're only allowed to police the neighborhoods where they think you should be and they think that uh, it's low income or these, this is the way that people should be treated, that's what you'll get. And Carl, I also like to just tag along on that and say that the media is a problem with media as well. And that's probably that's one of the reasons why we had started the group that we had with equity and media. But 
you know, when you hear things like black on black crime and, you know, all these nomenclatures and stuff that they put on the black community, uh, that's a reason. And so the psyche of some police officers is, you know, the, you know that we, we're so crime infested when there actually has been more reported white on white crimes, if you want to use that terminology, in our nation than has been black on black crimes. But we never hear right. anybody in the news say, oh, it was white on white crime today. <laughs> you know, so, so things like that too builds in the psyche of police officers who would just come on the force and thinking that, you know, that, you know, that's why diversity training is so, you know, uh, so important. Uh, so that they can understand culture and understand that the that the media put some stuff on us that really shouldn't have never been there. You know, it's just crimes by proximity. Bishop, they, uh, Dick Gregory makes this point <laughs> that when people talk on black on black crime and they say, you know, they should stop this black on black crime. <laughs> Dick Gregory said, now, wait a minute. <laughs> the majority of white people who get killed in America is done by white people. Right. The majority of black people who get killed in America is done by black people. And it has to do with what you said, proximity. He said, notice that people say, people say there must be a effort to stop black on black crime. They don't say there must be an effort to stop killing. So his suggestion is that, do they want people to leave the black community and find somebody else to kill? I mean, which is his point. Sergeant, do you have anything you want to add to this before we go into this really significant dis uh, discussion with Margot, who I want her to be prepared for the question that I'm going to raise with her in a minute. Sure, I agree with everything that everyone has said thus far. Um, I think it also uh, comes from the fact, going more direct to your question, um, we being black officers, we come from the black culture, so we're better able to understand our own issues and our own culture and our own people more so than someone from another culture. And one of the things that ha that happens is we hire uh, a lot of young white officers who come from middle or upper middle class neighborhoods who never actually really had that uh, interaction with a black person. We've had officers that have come from uh, Colorado who we put them on the street and now they're surrounded by a predominantly black neighborhood. They've never had that experience before. So they react on just what the bishop said, what they see in the news media, and uh, their perception of what a police officer is supposed to be. So many um, new officers come in here, they try to, um, they have the badge and the gun, and they want to impose their will on uh, on people, and uh, it usually turns out bad in the end. Here's what I wanted to share um, before we bring in Margo on, who's going to talk about mental health and the services they have. But I want people to think about this for a moment. Uh, we're going to be talking in a few moments about a bus trip that's going to go to Ocean City. And I had an opportunity to meet with uh, or talk with the Ocean City police chief. And he asked me the following question. His question was, these two black youth were vaping, according to him. And he said a police officer had given a lawful order, <laughs> stop vaping and leave the boardwalk. And his question to me was, uh, Mr. Snowden, why did they just didn't follow the lawful order? None of this would have happened. Nobody would have gotten tased, and <clears throat> nobody would have gotten arrested. And when I said to him what I'm about to tell you, the answer was George Floyd. He said to me, what does George Floyd have to do with <coughs> following a lawful order? And I said the following. These young men who were arrested, one was 17, one was 18. That means they were born in the year 2003 and 2004. So from the time of their birth, 2003 to 2021, they have, saw the, they have seen the following. Tamel Rice, who was 12 years old, get shot and killed by a police officer. They saw a young man named Teron Martin, who was only 17 years old, get shot and killed. Saw a 16-year-old black kid in Chicago, shot and killed. They saw Freddie Gray, 25 years old, shot and killed. Saw Brianna Taylor, 26, shot and killed. This has been the experiences. And there are so many people who assume that this generation of black youth who have watched people their ages and younger die, that it does not have an impact on them, that there's no trauma. Well, the reason I've asked Margo and her colleagues to come on, because I, I think that it does have an impact on this generation. 
and that we need to understand what's happening. So uh, Margo has been invited to come on along with her colleagues to explain to us what are some of the programs that they have available to this community. Margo, welcome to the living room. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Um, and thank you for inviting us here. I'm here with my colleague, Darrell Frazier. And just quickly, before we jump into your point, I mean, we've been really talking at the Mental Health Association about um, these sort of dual pandemics that, that have been taking place, right? As, as folks have been stuck, a lot of folks have been stuck at home or, you know, um, sort of kind of social media and TV, and then we're forced to watch these images of, of um, you know, violence and brutality that are being seen by children and older adults alike. And so, um, how are we addressing the, the rising rates of anxiety, and depression, and isolation that folks are experiencing in this moment um, and as we go forward? So I think I want to pass it, introduce Darrell Frazier, who's my colleague in, in this work, and um, Darrell talk about some of our programs and then sort of open it up and room for a little bit of discussion if there's time. Yes, I'm um, absolutely. Absolutely. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Darrell Fraser. I serve as the Policy and Community Engagement Manager and um, the Mental Health Association in Maryland. And to Margo's point, um, as we, we, we've definitely been having a conversation um, around just the health pandemic that has been happening with the uprises and the injustices that has been happening um, um, amongst you know, African American people and other minorities. Um, so we have the Mental Health Association in Maryland, we're Maryland's only volunteer nonprofit organization that's bringing together advocates, professionals, concerned citizens, consumers, and family members. And we have a range of different services that we provide. Me and Margaret's work fall under the umbrella of advocacy and systems innovation, um, the policy change, and uh, which really brings us here today to have a robust conversation with you all um, as we kind of like, you know, think through some of the incidents that have taken place and also just developing like, um, what are like the major concerns from people who are in the community work with communities that are the most vulnerable and the most impacted. Um, some of the stories that um, Mr. Carl Snowden had um, mentioned about the incident that happened in Ocean City, I've seen a um, video go viral on social media to see the reaction amongst um, just different, you know, colleagues, family members, friends, etc. I think it's getting to a point where so people are kind of becoming numb to the feeling. They are kind of tired of seeing these videos to the point where it is so we aren't even um, circling the videos around anymore because it's become it's happening so often and people are often talking about it um, consistently, you know. So um, just some of the other services that we have been um, kind of like just promoting and talking about are just like outreach and education. Um, to some of the services that we provide um, to like those communities who don't have access to uh, those um, particular kind of services, such as you know um, the children, Children's Mental Health Matters, which is a campaign that we offer, older about older adults about their minds that was for aging and older adults. We also offer trainings um, such as the Mental Health First Aid Training here in Maryland, which is a public education national certification course. We also do a program we offer which is called Engage. Um, which is a highly interactive and comprehensive skill based training program that gears towards increasing awareness around just developing um, skills and necessary relationships to engage in healthy um, relationships. And then just serves as oversight. This is like how do we um, engage those who are impacted and hold them accountable? So, just the consumer quality team in Maryland, um, which we like to call CQ2. Um, which partners with consumers, providers, and funding um, agencies to present, um, discuss, and find resolutions to problems that impact consumers and experiences in mental health. And so I'm sorry right there because um, I know that we're limited, limited to the amount of time that we have, but um, we also have partnering organizations where we develop, um, where we offer other resources as well, such as like, you know, a hotline um, where folks can call and um, refer to recommended to find specific services related to mental and behavioral health, et cetera. And I'm really, really interested in hearing what um, some of the ideas are from, you know, those of us who are attending this meeting, uh, what are your um, concerns that you're hearing on the ground, as we're kind of exploring and developing new relationships and partnerships with like ideal stakeholders and concerned citizens throughout the state of Maryland. Because as we engage in the Maryland um, legislative uh, session in 2022, we really want to push for policy change that is from the people. And that's keeping um, driven. And thanks again for um, allowing us to meet today. Let me ask you a question. As part of your listening tool, 
Do you come out to the community? Absolutely. Um, well, let me, well, let me, well, let me, let me, uh, let me. Uh, major aspect of it. Um, so now that the world is opening back up, I'm really excited about this being able to engage community in person again. But um, through visual advocacy and visual engagement, that's just one of our ways of us being able to engage community. And so we have, um, we are doing some tours right now. We're, we're going to the community, but we're also going to spaces such as this, where um, we have people who have ties to the community to better identify what are those other opportunities that we may not be aware of or that we may be missing on those gaps to where we can come into the communities that you all represent or you work in and really engage the people on the ground. Well, one of the reasons I ask you, do you come out to the community? Because you probably heard Bishop earlier talk about something happening Saturday. Are you guys willing to come out and meet people in this community in Anne Arundel County, in the Mead Village? Well. Bishop, uh, I'm sure, will provide you with where the group's going to be meeting at. We'd love to have mm -hmm. you come and be part of that on this coming Saturday. Okay. Yes, absolutely. So that's exactly the prime example. Um, as I was on the call today, yes, listening to the conversation that you all were having, um, opportunities like this, like engaging um, community um, events, meetings, um, things of that nature. So I'm definitely open to coming to meet people in person. I'm actually really excited. I'm basically getting ready to go. Bishop, will you extend a formal invitation to him? <laughs> <laughs> listen, listen, brother, come on on, on this Saturday. <laughs> yeah. I want to see your face in the place, 9.30 a.m. Okay. sharp at Van Bocklin Elementary School. We need you okay. right there, and then we're going to walk that whole West County community there, and you're going to be able to see some of everybody and love on some of everybody uh, on this Saturday. So. Um, if you, uh, I got to make sure that I can get your information and I can um, email you um, all of the events that I know that are happening here in July and August. Yeah, would you kindly, would you kindly put your, would you kindly put your contact information in the chat mm -hmm. box? Uh, Emma is a wonderful uh, uh, facilitator. She will be able to record that and, and we'll have a formal invitation to you and Margo and your team to come out and meet people on the ground and hear what they have to say. And I'm just curious about something I said earlier, whether either you, mm -hmm. Margo, or others have a point of view on this. I just said about a whole generation <clears throat> of young people, African Americans, who've been experiencing what you refer to as a situation that they've become numb to. I, I respectfully disagree with you. I don't think they've become numb. I think there's something else that's happening to them um, where mm -hmm. it appears that they're numb. I think they're angry. I think that you're finding mm -hmm. the situations that people are not identifying. When you see people being mistreated right. over a period of time, and someone comes and says to you, I've given you a lawful order. There was a former police chief who lived, or who worked here in Anne Arundel County, who said something I've never forgotten, and I think he's right. He says, just because something lawful doesn't make it not awful. When you treat people in a manner that is disrespectful, when people see you treat people who look like them in a disrespectful manner, when you say, I've given you a lawful order, they remember that George Floyd was given, quote, a lawful order, and he complied, and he's now dead. Brianna Taylor was in her bed, sleep. She's now deceased. So I think this new generation is kind of have a cynical view, if you will, of law enforcement and its purpose. So we'd love to have you come out and be a part of this discussion and hear what people on the ground think might be needed to help solve some of these problems. Yes, absolutely. And, um, and I agree with you. I definitely, um, I'm from Baltimore, Maryland, born and raised. I grew up in East Baltimore, um, raised by my senior grandmother. So I definitely can kind of understand and relate to some of the challenges um, that folks are experiencing. Unfortunately, I lost my mom and she had due to, um, you know, fortunate circumstance that had um, happened here in Baltimore City um, just due to criminal justice system. And so um, I believe that, I agree with you, a lot of our young people are experiencing PTSD. They are experiencing so many different um, mental health um, issues that we either silence or we feel ashamed of and sometimes within our own community. And when I say that, I, I don't mean that that is for everyone, but I do think that some people just from the spaces that I've been in when we have these discussions. Um, this isn't, we are 
it's not moral as enough amongst um, a lot of African Americans and to talk about mental health. Um, and I understand why it comes from decades of, you know, uh, past trauma and past experiences that we have had, and so we haven't always had access to mental health services or resources. And to this day, we still don't. So it's not that folks don't want to talk about it, or sometimes we don't want to like, take help, et cetera. But it's just that they, for so long, we haven't really had access to it. So when I see, you know, numb to the situation, not necessarily the same as if like, we don't care, or that young people aren't really, um, that young people, as you say, I agree, like, young people just have it. It's not even just young people. It's uh, a lot of individuals, it's adults, young adults, older adults. We're all tired. I'm tired. You know, I like, wake up every day and we push forward doing this work. And this work is easy. It's not easy for anyone. So I don't believe. Well, one of the things you're going to be um, also invited to, because you said you're interested in a lot of, of meeting people on the ground, we're going to Ocean City. We're going to take a bus to Ocean City. We're going to invite you to be a part of that. Our bishop is going to share with us, and we're going to have a discussion, because these gentlemen who are with us, and uh, Sergeant Spearman, these are police officers, former law enforcement officials who happen to be African Americans and who, too, want to see police and community relations improved. And so there is a bus, we call it the Summer Freedom Bus, reminisce of what people did in the 60s, where a group of people are going to go to Ocean City, and we're gonna have stops along the way in cities on Maryland's Eastern Shore. So Bishop, let's talk about that for a moment. Why do you think it's important to have this uh, event where we're taking African Americans and whites and people of goodwill getting on buses driving to Maryland's Eastern Shore to highlight what happened in Ocean City? Well, first of all, um, and, and it, I think it was for us disturbing what we saw on video and thank God for the person who right. had enough sense um, to video. video what took place or we would have had a whole different story. Um, but because of what we saw, uh, what was captured, we felt was excessive force being used by the police officers. And then secondarily to that, the chief of police there in Ocean City act like ain't nothing happened. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so we had a press conference where we galvanized and came together and we spoke out of our mouth that we're, we're one. And you gave the analogy with the green, the, the hornet. And, uh, and I also, um, uh, you know, back that, you know, by saying that when you violate one of us, you have to deal with all of us. And so we, you know, we, we are people of our word. Right. And so for those who are on the eastern shore, who need our help on the western shore here, it seems like, you know, we may, um, you know, be a step ahead or two um, with, um, you know, galvanizing and coming together. And they need the strength of us here on the western shore to say, hey, we are with you anytime that there is something, um, you know, wrong or, or evil that's taking place. We need to support each other. And that's what's happening in this day and time. And we decided, let's get on the bus. And, and, and let's, what let's, did you let's share with some together. of the people that's watching? Because I think, as you say, all across the country, people are watching what we're doing. And I think it's important for them to hear and more in, uh, and more specifically what we're doing. Name some of the elected officials that's going, the organizations as part of this, the fact that it's a broad coalition of people. Well, that's a, that's a good question because okay. <laughs> you probably know the list better than I do, Carl, on that. Uh, but again, like you said, we have um, gentlemen like um, Spearman and, and, and Randy and, and Lonnie. Lonnie. Uh, just met Lonnie on, on one of our calls. Uh, but, uh, you know, who are former police officers, uh, along with elected officials we have. I know uh, Delegate Bartlett is, right. is going and, and, and others who are going to, you know, slip my mind. Sheila Finlayson and, uh, you know, of course, uh, you know, that 50 and older thing kind of gets you. So I, I can't, all right, all right, immediately. Uh, and then we have community uh, leaders uh, that are going this uh, different civic organizations, this black organizations and white organizations. Leaders are saying, no, we saw it too. And we want to make sure that, 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 uh, that they feel our presence and, and understand. So good to see 
our, our white uh, counterparts and allies that are that are coming together to band together with us. That's going to be on the bus with us, you know, and it's going to be a great convoy because we. I know we got two buses uh, that are red. I even got my uh, my my church van just in case we need to crank that one up too uh, with, with more people. And we're meeting people on the shore that's going to get right. on the bus. I I, I believe so. <laughs> and then we have cars. People that, that are not going to be on the bus, but the convoy of, of, of people who's going to be driving themselves over. And uh, so it's going to be a huge event for us, but it's making a grand statement here in the state of Maryland and our nation at large that, uh, that we mean business when it comes to we are tired of all of the stuff that people are doing without accountability and think that they can just, it's not, you know, they've been hiding behind that good old boy system for so long. And look, and our young people are saying, uh-uh. That's right. You know, so what granddaddy and all them did or whatever, you know, and I know they had to show manners of respect or whatever case is back then and couldn't do certain things. But now the times have changed. And my son and, and, and folks of his age, millennials and all that, they're like, nah, uh we're not happy. But, and so we're saying, we're alongside with our young people as well, so uh, and so it's going to be a great event, Carl. Now this event <coughs> is going to take place this coming Monday, Monday, July 19th. People meeting in Annapolis. Uh, anyone who wants to go on this bus trip are welcome to join. Uh, Lisa uh, Rodman from the County Council has already indicated she's going to be on the bus uh, going to Ocean City, and there are other community leaders. But Randy and Lonnie and Jimmy, the question I know that's going to be asked, because the demonstrations <laughs> around police misconduct, why would African-American retired police officers get on a bus to focus the attention on police misconduct? Lonnie, you go first, and then we'll turn to Randy. Well, why are you so, going? I, well, I'm going because, like the gentleman said, I've had enough. Yeah. I've, I've myself, in Anne Arundel County, I've been a victim of police brutality, just from the way that I look. I had a policeman ask me, where's the drugs? <laughs> wow. You know, and so I think everybody have had, has had enough. The young people have had enough. The, the older people that couldn't do anything back in the day, but now can stand up and, you know, say this, this is enough. So I, I don't think people are willing to take this. I mean, and I'm just going to be honest with you, I know some officers that I work with, officers that I work with, that still was wearing a hood, just didn't wear it to work. <laughs> right. And I'm not trying to be racist or anything. I've heard some of the conversations. You know, I've, I've had enough myself. And, you know, thanks to you and Randy and Sergeant Spearman and, you know, Bishop and some other people, uh, Jackie, you know, they, you all have taken me under your wing, and I'm willing you know, to fight, and if it's for my life, then that's what it is. Sergeant Williams, you're on the bus. We're going to get on the <laughs> bus going to Ocean City. Why? I have no comment. I didn't. <laughs> you have, um, I went to the military in 1986 to 1993. Um, then I was a correction officer from 93 to 1996 police officer, retired sergeant from 96, 2016. So I spent 31 years in uniform. And what I was, before I did all that, was a black man living hmm. in America. Um, so I know what systemic and structural discrimination looks like. I know what it feels like, and working on the police department, I had front row seats with a Slurpee and popcorn. <laughs> right? um, so I saw it firsthand, and I got daily dosages of racism that I saw on the department and I decided to do something about it. I'm more of a numbers guy and analytically and analyzing policy, right? Um, to ensure that it comports with state law, local ordinances and federal law. Um, and what I found since I retired doing the work that I do with the caucus and other groups as well, ACLU and other groups, um, is that I find that a lot of policies do not comport with law and police will use cultural statements like, it's my job to protect my guys. Right? It's an empty cultural statement. I had a lot of chiefs say that. But it's an incomplete statement. I would tell them, yeah, it's your job to protect your guys from themselves. Right? Um, because they go out and do unlawful stuff 
perform unlawful acts, and then it's covered up. So protect them from themselves. I blame supervision on police departments more than I believe than I blame officers, right? Because they do what's allowed, right? Leadership from the top down, mm -hmm. right? Train them appropriately, right? And they'll do the right thing. Teach them to protect themselves, right? Simultaneously serving the community because that's what we put our hand on the Bible and swore to do. Protect and serve, not ourselves and law enforcement, but the community, mm -hmm. right? And the transparency and accountability is crucial as the bishop stated earlier, because often they'll say these are isolated incidents. Um, in order to prove that as a negative, you need to get the data, mm -hmm. right? And you need to critique the policies. Once you get the data, then you'll see that that's not necessarily the case. There's an agency in Anne Arundel County in which field inter reports, field interview reports, I should say, which is the first cousin of stop and frisk forms, right? Um, is utilized in the community. Right, and they have their own thesis. More frequency of stops, you know, reduces crime, which is an unproven theory. And they're not going to prove it because it doesn't exist, right? 66% one year, people of color were stopped. Only represent 26% of the demographics, the population. The next year, it went up to 75%. Again, only represent 26% of the population. So this is not a one-off. This is not an isolated incident. This is systemic and it's structural. All right. Sergeant uh, Spearman, you're getting on the bus. You're going to Ocean City. You're going to, thank God, be providing security as well. Give us your take on why it's important for you to go on this bus ride. Uh, several reasons. Number one reason, when I decided to become a police officer, that was what I signed up to do. I didn't sign up. Uh, to go around and impose my will on people. I didn't sign, uh, sign up to go around and bully people or anything like that. Have I ever used force? Yes, I did, but it was only when it was warranted. Um, there are a lot of good men and women who are still on the, on the job, who can't speak for themselves, and they can't defend the sanctity of this profession um, because they're not allowed to engage in public uh, political positions, only unless you're certain people, if you're uh, going to dress uh, insurrections and things like that, are you allowed to voice your opinion and get away with it. But now that you know there, I have grandchildren, I have children, and um, those young men that were uh, accosted the way they were, those could have been my kids. Those could have been your kids. and. Uh, we all deserve to enjoy life, and we all uh, have civil rights. We all have the right of choice, and we all have freedoms. And uh, I want to see and ensure that the things that happen um, don't happen again in Ocean City. Bishop, one of the things that I find when we have discussions like this, ultimately, policymakers have to make decisions, right? right. We work to elect people to public office. They have to take the strong position of knowing what's in the best interest of their community. And we're going to do a little improvising tonight. One of our guests who is scheduled to be with us, Charlie Cooper, can't be with us for, uh, for whatever reason, but he can't be with us. And I thought because we have in the house a policymaker, we'd like to invite her to the living room. So I, we have the councilwoman join us here. <laughs> Johnson, councilwoman, yeah, give her the councilwoman, Sarah Lacey from the first district. Yeah. Free to go. <laughs> I heard the bishop when he first welcomed you on board, when you first came in. You've been hearing this discussion. I'm just curious, as a policymaker, you listen to these men uh, who have had this experience as police officers. What is your thinking about the need for, and you voted for, body cameras? Because we didn't always have body cameras here in Anne Arundel. Tell us what you got out of this discussion. Well, in addition to being a policymaker, before I became a policymaker, I was a practicing attorney who represented folks who have been wrongfully convicted um, and incarcerated beyond when they when they should be. And um, those representations gave me a particular a viewpoint uh, of of saying you almost can't have enough accountability and different mechanisms because you know we're all we're all human beings. Um, 
but we we've come to learn things like you know eyewitness testimony is so unreliable and so many people are convicted based on based on just that when body cameras became available i couldn't help but think things like well maybe the police officers you know who did bad stuff to my clients wouldn't have had there been body cameras and at the same time i I know that um, you know it's 99.9% of police officers do the right thing all the time, and I fully, I fully support that. I think that we're, as a policymaker, and then in a position of, well, there is a tension. You have to hold a couple of competing ideas in tension, and figure out how can we resolve them in a way that um, that preserves and increases the dignity of all people, and the way that we treat. We treat all people, um, and it's a privilege to be able to do something like vote for um, body cameras to be a policy of the Anne Arundel County Police Department and to uh, to fund the acquisition of of those cameras. But I will also admit to you that I had doubts at first because um, you know and this came up very early on in uh, what is my first you know term as a policymaker. Um, I wanted to be sure that there would be some kind of programmatic assurances that that the body cameras would be implemented in the proper way, because you can't just assume that. That That's is right. what I learned and brought to the table from my prior experience. You can't just assume that it's going to happen right, that the cameras are going to turn on at the right time, or that training will mean they always turn on. And we're going to, you know, hear of issues that unless there's a commitment to proper training instruction and implementation then i was not going to support the purchase in the first place and i had strong conversations with folks in the administration side to say this is to me this is non-negotiable you want my support i need a i need a real promise and a commitment to how these are going to be implemented and i think we did end up with a, a year or so uh you know delay and that was in part because there was a real serious effort to make sure that if we're going to implement this program that we do it right because that's what the public deserves that's what our police officers deserve anyone who serves the public deserves and so i'm i'm proud to be on the other side of that and then to be you know also anticipating eagerly how the rollout goes and um, I feel very confident that our, our chief is going to do a good job. Bishop, we're always soliciting people to come to the event for the peace walk. <laughs> have you asked the councilwoman to come? Well, I think she already knows all about it, but it's yeah. just in case you, you haven't <laughs> in your district. Yes. <laughs> it's on my calendar. It's, it's on the calendar. Yeah. She has it on the calendar. but. Uh, um, Councilwoman Sarah Layson, and I, and I know this, you know, as a fact, uh, she's always in the community helping out and supporting. And um, so, and I commend you for for you being present and wanted to uh, fight for change. And, and, and I see you out there, so it doesn't go unnoticed. So I, I definitely appreciate it. I do want to make a comment. Um, when we first started the initial conversations about the body cameras, mm -hmm. And Carl and you were very instrumental, and and the great Reverend uh, uh, Ricky Nelson Jones, um, with those conversations. I remember when the former chief, when we were when we were when we were in talks, and he started pointing at the budget as though two million dollars or whatever it cost mm -hmm. was too much. That's right. And then I think it might have been the great Reverend that 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 made the quote. You know, uh, something to the effect that you know how much does a life cost you know um, two million dollars right. you know you're going to look at that we're looking at lives being saved you know um, you, you get these incidents or whatever you turn that camera on we know it causes people to kind of oh, yeah. think a little whole lot different when that body camera is on so that was kind of like one of the first initial conversations and then he still didn't want the body camera and it took incidents like uh, George Ford and stuff for the county executive to say, you know what, enough is enough. And then, and then the council and everybody got together. And, and I think that really catapulted the, the, the decision when we started seeing things nationally take place. Uh, and, and we didn't want it here in Anne Arundel County. So, uh, but it took uh, uh, Councilwoman Sarah's voice and vote uh, to be able to say, I don't want 
that here in our county as well. So That's I just right. wanted to mention that as, as I was recalling in my mind. <laughs> from That's exactly well, right. If I may add, mm -hmm. you know, I can't accomplish anything by myself on, on the council. It takes a majority at least right. um, to, to support that. And I think, you know, we had a, a majority on, on some of our votes related to body cameras and a, a 7 0 on other votes. Uh, depending on where we were in the process, but you I also think... had four, three. That's true. <laughs> four, so four three was on, yeah. Just so the people know, I, I tell, told Sarah and others, there was uh, the police department under a former county executive. He used the police to do horrible things, spy on people, create dossiers, used police officers. It's all documented. To he would see a woman that he liked, <laughs> decided to use the police to get her telephone number, find out where she lived and that sort of thing. Wow. It was just horrible. He was convicted of misconduct yeah. in public office. And so the county council voted along partisan lines, four Democrats, three Republicans, just to apologize, simply apology to the people he had misused. So sometimes you have to do what's right, even if you don't have all seven votes in your favor. And I want to commend you for doing that because a lot of people, Jackie Olson is one of the persons, Lewis Bracey, um, the late Tom Redmond, who happened to be a councilman and a Republican. He was one of the ones on what was the former county executives ending his list. And you apologize as a county council. And I want to thank you for that. And also, early on in this, your first term, you voted with the majority to apologize for the lynchings that have occurred in Anne Arundel County. So again, it's important to have people in office who are empathetic and who understand the importance of making sure that we correct the past healings. And so in a moment, I'm going to uh, introduce Larry Diggs, who's going to invite you to another community event. <laughs> and this event is going to be designed to bring the entire community together. And I understand from talking with Larry, he needs some help. And Larry, this is your opportunity to tell us what kind of help you need for the next meeting that's going to take place, it's going to be at the Wally H. Base Legacy Center. And somebody's got their microphone that's on. That's Larry. <laughs> which is why we've got this feedback. You're doing a great job, Carl. Keep going. <laughs> it's wonderful. Sounds good. You did, you did have my work, and I appreciate it. And your introduction is very important because you and uh, the bishop are terrific to what we attest and look forward to in our community. I thank God for both of you and every one of the people that have been on uh, the show today on uh, the living room, and uh, then I'm, I'm going to move on. But first of all, we're, we're the caucus at the behest of our, our leader, uh, Carl Sloan, has asked that uh, we come together, uh, start to come together this year, uh, so that we can reattach and, and, and come together as a family that we were before this COVID hit. And uh, he has asked us to uh, develop something that could uh, achieve that goal. And to that end, uh, we've established a committee uh, that will, on off Tuesday, August 10th, from 5 to 8 p.m., uh, will conduct, will have a, uh, we're calling it a uh, summer festival, caucus summer festival. Uh, let me explain what that all would entail. First of all, uh, we're going to use the facility, like uh, Carl said, uh, behind the base center, it's going to be where the Boys and Girls Club is. Uh, there's a parking lot there, a big beautiful parking lot that's sometimes underutilized, but we're going to put good use to it. Um, we also, uh, with that, we're going to be providing uh, some tables and chairs uh, for our guests, and we're asking that the, those of you who have beach chairs or comfortable chairs, bring them with you so that they can, you can have, you can be a little bit more comfortable. Uh, Restrooms are available with uh, a cooling station as needed. Uh, we will have a DJ who will provide music and a PA system. Uh, electricity will be provided for that. Um, as far as uh, food is concerned, uh, we are asking those who would like to contribute uh, uh, a special dish like we normally do uh, during our uh, uh, monthly meetings on, under normal circumstances. We're asking that you, some, that you uh, give us a call and, and let us know what you'd like to contribute. Uh, so that we can have a, a nice spread for, for folks. Uh, we're all contributing something, everybody on the committee as well as, as, well as some caucus members. Uh, we're anticipating uh, probably about 
uh, 100 plus people. So if you're planning on bringing something, uh, you can gauge that number, use that number as a, as a guide to what you'd like to prepare. Um, the, again, it's going to be a, a, a very comfortable, uh, we're looking to, I think Carl indicated that we, we might have a special guest or two, but it's, of course, not going to be a, an agenda, it's just get together, come together, uh, show our love. Uh, and that's something that we always look forward to doing to each other every time we get together. And uh, uh, the bishop and Carl always talk about, you know, love thy neighbor, love each other, love thyself. And that's what we're going to do. And we're going to have an uh, excellent opportunity to do that, just that. Um, if there are any questions, there's a, the, uh, you can get in touch with me uh, uh, through my uh, uh, phone. It's 443-243-4998 if you have any questions. Or you can see one of the uh, uh, caucus members, either Elder James, uh, uh, T. Goodwin. If I left off some names, forgive me. Are there any number of people you can see in the caucus? Juanita, uh, uh, Cage Lewis. Um, there are any number of members that you can see to put us together to find out what you'd like to bring and let us know what you're going to bring. We look forward to seeing you. Um, it's going to be a fabulous time. And uh, praise God, we're going to have that, that one opportunity that we've been looking forward to for a year and a half. Bishop, you know, Larry Bishop just Dino recently, Larry. recently had a birthday. Had a birthday. Right. Larry, Larry, you got to put Larry, you gotta, on mute. You have to put it on mute. Yeah. We're getting echoes. <laughs> Uh, Larry recently had a Larry birthday, and, um, and uh, I think he still have put it on mute, right? <laughs> yeah, it's still showing it's yeah. not on mute. But, but in any event, um, he, turned he turned 78. He's one of the guys that have come to this community and have really helped give all of his resources and attention. So I want to tell people who are watching, please do join us on August 14th, no, excuse me, 10th, August 10th. Thanks for the correction. <laughs> August 10th, and it starts at 5 o'clock. It's 5 to 8 p.m. Um, it's open to the public, and it's the first time um, we've got to really put in. You got to mute, uh, Larry. Just click that mute button there. It keeps the... Emma, give my hand. As host, can you mute? There we are. Thank you, Emma. Um, we really want people from the community to come out and participate. This is going to be a great opportunity. As Larry's pointed out, it's been more than a year since we've gotten together in person. And so this is going to be the last event of the summer where we're getting together in person just to be able to share our concern and love for each other. And I hate to say this, Bishop, but it's true. You know, since we haven't gotten together, we've lost people. The pandemic, number of people have died that sort of thing. And those of us who are still here, we have a great reason to celebrate. And so we want to come together as a community um, just to get together and thank so many people. There are first responders who did a fantastic job. Uh, while we've had criticism of the police, we recognize that the police have been very helpful to us in many ways. These officers that's going with us to Ocean City, they're going to be providing the security, the knowledge of law enforcement, we want to make it absolutely clear that the United Black Clergy, the NAACP, the Caucus of African American Leaders, Connecting the Dots, Show Up for Racial Justice, these organizations and others who are going to be part of this movement to go to Ocean City are not anti-police. Right. On the contrary, we're pro-justice. We want to make sure that every single person get treated fairly. Sergeant Williams put it best when he talked about the notion is to protect and serve. That's what the culture should be. That has not been what it's been, and we're going to work hard to change the culture. So by having this event on August 10th in Annapolis at the Wally H. Base um, Center, people will get an opportunity to meet old friends and greet new friends. If you're watching tonight and you want to be a part of this, there's only one mistake that Larry made. Larry, you gave an excellent presentation. But you made one mistake. You do not have to prepare food for 100 people. Just prepare enough food to share with some people. Because <laughs> most of the people that's watching tonight, I doubt they're going to bring crabs for 100 people. But please feel free to join us on that particular occasion. And one of the things that, as we wind down, one of the things that I wanted to also share, uh, Bishop, and I know you know others that may have this problem. Like Larry, 
I sometimes had problems trying to figure out how to maneuver and how to deal with this new technology that we have. <laughs> I mean, there are all kinds of stuff that you can do online. And there's an assumption that everybody can do that. And that's not the case. And so thanks to Emma Buckman, who's going to be giving us this announcement in a few moments, I want everybody who's listening, if you have any problem ever with dealing with the technology, if you're watching, they've always tried to figure out how am I able to share information on the screen? How can I go to a chat box? How can I do all these various things that uh, you can now do? There is a special workshop that's going to be done, and it's free of charge. Emma, please share with our viewing audience this upcoming workshop that anybody can sign up for. Thank you, Carl. Um, yes, so um, I mentioned this last month that we were still trying to find a good date, um, and uh, we finally found a date with the very talented web developer who also revamped the Caucus for African American Leaders page. Um, so we have a training date for everyone, um, and it's going to be Wednesday, July 21st at 6 p.m. So that's Wednesday, July 21st at 6 p.m. If you're interested in participating, please feel free to um, email me or call me. Um, I already have a couple people who signed up. My email address for those who need it is emma, E-M-M-A, at marchonmd.org. And my cell phone number is 443-618-3094. And again, this wouldn't, this wouldn't be like the back-end Alan Turing-esque sort of stuff. This would be more of the, um, this is like the making it look good, but like it, it's like the middle level of making a website look good, building it, you know, there are really useful skills to have that I still haven't not mastered, and so I'm excited to do this training. And while I have this spot, I also wanted to announce that there's another um, training, it's a bystander intervention training. I announced that last month we had to postpone it because of people's schedules, but it is going to happen on August 4th. Um, and I believe it's at 6 p.m., but there is a Facebook event on the March of Maryland Facebook page. Again, if you have questions about that, you can email me or call me emails Emma at March on MD, um, and that's on August 4th at 6. And now I wanted to quickly pass it to Ms. Linda Davis, who has an announcement about a screening coming up. So I'll pass it to Linda. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Emma, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, Carl and Bishop Palmer. Um, showing up for racial justice is going to be on the bus on um, July 19th. We're excited to um, join you and believe in justice and we'll show up. And so related to the bus trip, one of the stops is going to be the um, Confederate uh, Monument in Easton, the Talbot Boys Monument. Um, and so we're doing a screening on July 26th uh, of a film called The Neutral Ground related to taking down the monuments in New Orleans. It's very relevant to what's happening here in Maryland and us wanting to get that monument down. And so that's happening on July 26th at 7 o'clock um, I'm going to put the information in the chat on Zoom, and maybe Emma could put it in the Facebook um, group. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And before we conclude, uh, I just wanted to let people know who in the city of Annapolis, if you're interested in running for public office, you only have until July 26th. It's the deadline to file if you're running for public office in Annapolis. This is an off election year, but the mayor of Annapolis is up for re-election, as is all eight members of the city council. Three of the members of the city council have announced they will not be running, so there will be an open seats and people who are interested in running need to apply by July 26. As of today's program, Mayor Gavin Buckley has no opposition. Um, and he's running for re-election. And there are some other members on the city council who currently have no opposition. But again, on the 26th of July, that's the date to do the following deadline. The election will be held, the primary, in the fall of this year, followed by the elections in November. And we want to encourage people to be able to go out and vote. The last two things I will say before turning this over to Bishop for the final uh, comments are the following. One, tomorrow, it's absolutely essential that if you're able to go to the Western District Police Station 
which is located on Telegraph Road in Anne Arundel County, you go there. This is the last uh, police trial board under the current law that will allow, will allow police officers to judge whether another police officer has done something wrong. We think that because this is open to the public, you'll be able to watch the proceedings. You can judge for yourself. You can see whether or not you think that the police officer used excessive force, as is being alleged when he put his knee on the neck of this individual. If you're off tomorrow, starts at 9 o'clock, please, please do come and participate. Many of us will be there watching the proceedings. And then secondly, I'm glad that Linda had indicated she and others from Showing Up for Racial Justice will be on the bus. There was a movie called Get on the Bus years ago. Um, this when they were taking people to the Million Man March. They did a program, a television program called Get on the Bus. And Get on the Bus, Bishop, is really symbolic because getting on the bus is people saying, in essence, I want to be part of a group that want to make America better and not bitter. We've seen so many instances where we've seen people uh, have adversities and dealing with all of these strifes, but we've also saw America at its best. We've seen when Americans of goodwill come together, we change America for the better. And I think most people who are watching know that when the bus rides took place in the 60s, going into places that my good friend Pete talked about, Mississippi being a great state, uh, <laughs> we know that Mississippians, like Fannie Lou Hamer, like Megar Evers, saw that Mississippi and America could be better. And they welcomed people to come in and in John Lewis's word, make good trouble. And as a result of the good trouble, we think we have a better America. Well, that's the kind of spirit we want to take to Maryland's Eastern Shore, where a young black man, his name is Antoine Black, he was 19 years old, was murdered. And we don't want to see that continue. And by people getting on the bus and participating, their presence can make a difference. So again, thank you for allowing us to be with you in the living room <laughs> and to share this opportunity with the community. Thank you, Carl. And like I always say, this is the living room where real conversations <laughs> take place. And so you heard it from the best uh, that come out. Everyone uh, did a great job uh, with the conversation tonight. It's always good to have um, the Caucus of African American Leaders that have host their monthly meetings right here in the living room. And I saw a note here, Carl, I don't know if I want to make sure in September uh, that uh, you guys may be back at the uh, at the base Legacy Center. That's correct. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to take the living room on the road. <laughs> <laughs> well, That's, you did it before, though. I did it before. I, I saw the living room on the road. <laughs> for the memorial, for the lynching memorial that, there in Severna Park. That's we exactly went on the road. right. So we may I have to check with my uh, check with my team, there, yeah. the media team, to see, see if we at least uh, do one meeting on the road there. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about it. But listen, we're out of time, but we're not out of faith. We're not out of love. We're not out of peace and joy. Thank you so much for joining us. And I think we have here the that the Jones. great reverend yes, is actually going to give us the benediction. So if he will come up here and, uh, and let us have a good closeout benediction. And right after the benediction, you're going to hear our closeout son, a song by uh, uh, the convener's own son. Uh, <laughs> uh, that is uh, the best rapper in the region. Kojo Snowden. So you're going to hear him close us out after the great preacher give us the benediction. Okay. And before you do, you're from the South, right? New Orleans, Louisiana. And, 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 and you, <laughs> will, you will testify, will you not, that the summer bus ride, the freedom rides, really did help change America, including where you came from, Absolutely. In Louisiana. Absolutely, positively. It's a great idea. Great Thank idea. you. Can't beat it. Uh, our benediction is going to come from Jude verses 20. 5 and 26, the last two verses of the book of Jude. Now unto him who's able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Let us respond. Amen. 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 And amen. amen. God bless you. God bless you. Hit it, Randy. <laughs> Welcome to the living room.
living room. Real conversations take place. Dear listeners, viewers, supporters, fans, friends, or family of the show, we are honored to have you here.